Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm happy to have on Hollywood actor Josh Hopkins. And the reason I'm having Josh on is we go way back. Um, back in 1988, I moved to Lexington, Kentucky and went to the Sayre School. And I was in fifth grade and uh, was there for two years with Josh Hopkins. And Josh was an 11th and 12th grader. So to us little kids, uh, he played basketball. He was just super cool. We all loved him. And he was really great to us. And he left from there, went to college, and then uh, became an actor. So his first role was in a Law & Order episode. And from there, he's also been in big hits like G.I. Jane, The Perfect Storm. And in this episode, we talk a lot about how he became an actor, uh, some of his, his celebrity <laughs> sightings. Um, when he got to Hollywood in New York, he talks about hanging out in Leonardo DiCaprio's entourage after Titanic came out when he was the biggest star in the world. He talks about almost getting a part in Jerry Maguire and much, much more. Um, Josh grew up in Kentucky, so we talk a little bit about Kentucky basketball, you know, where he got that love, some of his favorite players. Um, we talk about his father, who uh, served in Congress in the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, representing Kentucky and kind of the pros and cons of having a father in uh, government. And then his favorite player of all time for Kentucky is Rex Chapman, and now he is the co-host of the Rex Chapman podcast. So really enjoyed uh, this episode. Um, it's a little bit different um, because it's not basketball-based, but we talk about basketball, and we open up a world of behind the scenes of you know being a Hollywood actor. So without further ado, please welcome Josh Hopkins to the podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Josh, welcome to the podcast. I am happy to be here, Corey. How you doing today? Doing good. How you doing down in Austin? Loving it, man. Loving it. It's really nice down here. It's January. I'm in Colorado. I got snow outside. It's 15 degrees. What What's the weather like for you right now? Uh, 66 degrees, 12.30 p.m. And let's see, the high today is 68. No, 71. 71. Okay. Pretty perfect. Pretty okay. perfect. Perfect weather down there, except when it's August. Then you have too much heat. It is not perfect then. And then it's 107. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, you are wearing, for those that can't see right now, a Kentucky shirt. And we go back. Uh, I've known Josh for a long time. And, um, you know, you're a big Kentucky fan. What is your earliest UK basketball memory? Wow, that's a great question. I, I you know, we won it in 78, but I was seven. So I don't truly remember. I remember going to games uh, with my dad and them screaming goose. And I thought they were booing. And I was like, why are they booing? He's so good. Um, so that I remember listening to those games with uh, after that on the radio with Dirk Minifield and Horde and Hurt, Sam Bowie. Uh, I remember that's when I really, like the year after is when I really became you know, old enough to really be aware. I knew we won it the year before, but I didn't know what that that really meant. But really, the classes after that. But I remember my earliest memories are listening to them, you know, boo, Goose Givens, but they weren't. And, be, and beyond, be, just why did you become a UK fan? Just like Osmosis, where everyone that lives there as a little boy becomes one? Or you, you know. have one instance? Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's cultural, it's tribism, it uh, becomes a, a sense of pride. I have a theory, the reason definitely our fan base is so rabid, and, and I can point out other sort of fan bases in some ways. Like, we, Kentucky, we don't get any respect. We feel left out. We are a pariah amongst different groups. First of all, we have no teams, no pro teams, zero. So that makes a huge difference. This is our pro team. And we grew up, Kentucky basketball was, it's it's our identity. You know, I remember just people think of Kentucky and then they think of uh, Appalachia and poor and the last in, 
education second to last. Um, but when you saw Tony Delk and Walter McCarty and and those guys walk out on the court, I'm like, that's how I want to be. They look like F-16s coming mm -hmm. on the court. And that's how I wanted to be represented. But I feel like we uh, in Kentucky, in the because I've lived all over, in the North, they think we're the South. In the South, they think we're the North. In the West Coast, they think we're the heartland. The East Coast doesn't know where we are. We're not bordering the water. Uh, New Yorkers can't even point us out on a map. I mean, it, we're we're our own thing. So it, we glom on to this identity so much that we become insane, rabid fans. And I feel like Philly is kind of like that at times because mm -hmm. they're not New York and they're not even Boston. They're not Chicago. They got a huge chip on their shoulders and they're insane. Um, I identify with those Philly fans a lot. They're they're crazy. Right. But I feel like t that's why we are nuts about it is we don't belong anywhere. Yeah. And, you know, I've been to a lot of football games, Notre Dame, Alabama, Georgia, Michigan, Michigan State. And my wife is from Nebraska. And I've gone to a couple of Nebraska football games. They're just like Kentucky fans in basketball. It is it is nuts how the, the, the mood of the team will affect the entire mood of the state. Right. Yeah. And that that falls in line with exactly what I'm saying, right? In Nebraska, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they don't have a do they have, they don't have a pro team. They they you know many people couldn't point Nebraska out on the map. They they're like, where is that? Is that on the west coast? Is that the heartland? Is it north? Is it too? No is it is it like ah yeah north or is it you know? <laughs> it's right. it falls in line with my theory. Oh, absolutely. No, it makes perfect sense when you say that. Um, due to your love of Kentucky basketball, you've had a lot of players through the years you've watched and fallen in love with, but who's your favorite UK player of all time? I mean, uh, I got to guess Rex Chapman, <laughs> Rex Chapman. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he hit me at the exact right time. You know, he's only like three years older than me, but when you were in like the junior high, then high school and he's in, you know, at Kentucky and beyond you, that's a big difference then. And I used to follow him around the mall. You know, this is pre-cell phones, get a quarter. Call, hey, guys, Rex is at Fayette Mall. You know, <laughs> mom, will you take me to Fayette Mall? <laughs> uh, he was just the perfect timing. I mean, he was a Kentucky kid. And he was so, people that are younger that don't really remember his game, they're like, oh, he could jump. And he was so much more than that. His game was dirty and, and effectively flashy and he just had it and he was like the coolest player in the country and you know when you have it it's not necessarily the best player all the time but the coolest player mm -hmm. in the, like we had it with john wall he was mm -hmm. the coolest player in the country he didn't win uh the player of the year awards whatever we had uh anthony davis was by far the best player in the country but he was not the coolest player in the country i don't know why i don't know who was it was like you know those flashy dunking zion was the coolest player you know it's a uh, he was the coolest player and he was from kentucky and i you know could watch him in his high school career and saw him at rep arena in the in the sweet 16 and by far but i mean i've you know I, I, it's tony delk i loved mash i loved um I love Dirk Minifield early on. Uh, I just, but Rex, you know, that's my guy. And when he, uh, when he went, went pro, did your new favorite pro team become the Charlotte Hornets like everybody else in Kentucky? Immediately, <laughs> immediately. But you know what? People don't realize that sucked. We couldn't, we, we had to wait for the box score in the morning to see what he did. Like there was no da 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 da. Let's go out to Charlotte and see. Mm -hmm. it, it became much harder to follow his career at that point. You know, it was. Uh, I probably would have stayed more rabid longer had I been able to really watch. If you remember every year, there'd be like an NBA ex exhibition game at Rupp. I think he came through one year, didn't he? And it sold yeah. out. Does that sound I, right? Yeah, it sounds right. But I think I might have already been in college or something. Wasn't that a little later? Well, I think Patino did it with the Celtics. Same thing. Like, oh right, oh, oh right, that's right. And I'm sure I, I don't know. That's, um, but you now do a podcast with your favorite basketball player Rex Chapman, and doing great right now. If anyone's out there that wants some good uh, 
light, uh, but in-depth conversations for basketball junkies. I highly recommend it. But uh, what's been the highlight of working with uh, working with Rex? Man, it's just imagine that. Imagine 13 year old me finding out uh, in the future, you will do a podcast with Rex Chapman. I'd freak out and then I'd be like, what is a, What's podcast? a podcast? Yeah, But I would freak out. And I'd be like, you two are friends. I'd be like, no way. Uh-uh. And we've been friends now for over, I guess, 10 years and 10 years. Yeah, about 10. Yeah. And he, I still sometimes like the phone will ring and I'll who Rex Chapman. I'll be like, <laughs> you what's up you know <laughs> right i still freak out 13 year old me still freaks out and my friends will be like every once in a while i'll be like rex is coming and they'll be like yeah wow wow it's just cool you know and we've talked to so many like i found myself uh several like my other big idol sports idol growing up was eric dickerson the running back played for the Rams. We had him on and there I was with Rex Chapman and Eric Dickerson. I mean, I was, and then like we had Tim Couch on there. I was with Rex Chapman and Tim Couch. I, I had to stop pinching myself and join the conversation because that's just childhood bucket list, crazy stuff. That's just been so much fun. Plus we've had the greatest guests I was trying to think of something before I got on here because I knew that might be a question, you know, because I always forget we've had over 70 and I'm always like, oh, we had this. we just had Scott Padgett, which is must listen for any phenomenal Kentucky kid. Phenomenal. I interview. mean, he is we all grew up in Kentucky uh, on our driveway going three, two, one. He beats Duke. He did it. And he's a Kentucky kid and talks about it. And bleeds it and it was it was great but we've had um again eric we just had coach shashevsky that was crazy we've had uh two other we had scott drew and gary williams two other coaches that have won it um uh jeff goodman was great people like that have listened to it that are cat fans are pissed that they have to like jeff goodman now but we've i mean we've had um Bob Costas, we've had Will Bond, we've had uh, Isaiah Thomas, we've had Steph Curry, we've had Shaq, uh, Katie Lang. I mean, we we broad, it's broad, you know, we go with a lot of different, you know, types and and and, and uh, even political. Uh, Steve Kerr, Jamal Crawford was one of my favorites because mm. he's just the dirtiest player I've ever seen. I got to ask him about that. Stan Van Gundy. Last, uh, about two months ago, I went up to Dallas to see Golden State play Dallas. And, I mean, that was bucket list, seeing Curry and then seeing Luka. I mean, that was double check. But I was there and I ran into, a, like, Stan Van Gundy and uh, um, uh, Candace Parker, who was a, mm -hmm. and Kerr and Curry were we're all, I was there and they had all been on the show. I'm like, this is, this is weird. And I'm constantly with my girlfriend, the TV comes on. He's been on the show. She's mm -hmm. been on the show. It's getting to that point where it, it's just really cool that I've gotten to talk to all these people. Oh, that's awesome. And then who is a dream guest of yours, Josh, that uh, if I told you, you get anyone you want, who would I you mean, want on? We've had Eric Dickerson. We've had Tim Couch. Uh, that's a great question. I'd probably go with... Um, I don't know. I'd go something non-sports, even though that's what I geek out on is sports. But I get a big, uh, a big sports fan. You know, who's a giant sports fan that's really you know Jack Nicholson? <laughs> That'd Top be pretty Lakers. cool. <laughs> that would be the dream. Josh, that'd be great. Doesn't seem like the podcasting type, but you know. No, we, that's that's why it's a dream. That's why it's a dream, yeah. Mm -hmm. That will never um, be fulfilled. We're going to get in the weeds here that probably three people um, are going to enjoy this part. But, you know, you and I knew each other. Well, we were at Sayre School at the same time, which is a school in downtown Lexington. I was in fifth grade uh, with these little rugrats running around where you were senior. And you had a teammate during that time named David DeMarcus. Mm -hmm. And David DeMarcus 
in this small little school in Kentucky made national news, and you were a witness to that. Can you tell me about this uh, national newsmaking event that happened with David DeMarcus from Sarah School? You sh- sure can. He, um, he, Dave DeMarcus, and you know this, and it, what is is Jimmy Chitwood. I mean, he talked like this, and he grew up on a farm, and all he does is farm and shoot and work. I didn't know how to work then. You know, now these kids, they know how to work. People teach them cone drills and go. And it's cool to work now. Like the grind, I'm in the lab. You know, when we were, when I was young, it was kind of cool to be like, I just got it. I don't even have to work. And I didn't know how, and he knew how. He was born with it. And that guy could just, and can still, by the way, just plain shoot it just fill it up he just had it and you probably know the stats here but one day we played a team and he had 19 three-pointers in the game set the national record then had I forget how many points he had uh but he didn't even play the fourth quarter we were up on so bad but there was an aspect of like me grabbing a rebound to put back in wide open and being like, mm, shoot it down. <laughs> you know, once he got going, we were up and it, it became that thing. But it was such a, I mean, he was in, uh, people won't realize, remember this either, where so faces in the crowd in Sports yep. Illustrated. You know, there was this thing called magazines that were like, they weren't digital, that you had to open them and flip a page. And he was in that. And it was just great because he's a, just a a guy that never couldn't is couldn't get a big head. Doesn't it's not within his it's not in his bag. He doesn't have that club in his bag. So it was one of the greatest things of our the uh, junior high and high school. Did you guys know it at the social? But did you know it at the time? Like you were witnessing a special game there. Like was it evident for everybody yeah. in the gym? Okay. Yeah, at some point. I mean, you see a guy get hot, and then he hit one and then he misses one then he hits one he hits another he hits another and then it's like the if he hits this the roof's going to come off he hits it you know and then pulls from deep and hit and you're like okay we're on one today Mm -hmm. we're on one um they tried to do with me the the next game and i went oh for 70 yeah and we lost by 70 there you go yeah Yeah. poor coaching by jim langster (laughs) yeah uh, exactly Well, full circle. So David and I connected, golly, probably seven years ago, eight years ago, I saw him in Tate's Crease Gym or something. And uh, his son was playing. I don't know why I was there. I was coaching at the time in Lexington. And uh, we started talking about prep schools. And I ended up helping his son uh, go to Bridgeton Academy up in Maine for a year. And oh, uh, yeah. they late. loved that. So it's it's just funny how all these years later, um, the guy I looked up to, now I'm helping his son, the next generation, Isn't that crazy? Try, to, try to get to get yeah, yeah, Little Dave was good. He, he was good, but played some more, but he, he didn't. He was a different game. He was more athletic than Dave, but couldn't quite put it in. Couldn't shoot like him, but no one can. Exactly. But that was part of his recruiting pitches. Like he's got some good DNA, but yeah, yeah. he's still got it. <laughs> yeah. Now, now you were, um, let's get into the next part of here is acting. You're, you're an actor now. And um, so. how did you get into acting from Lexington? Tell me your, your career path and why you even wanted to do it. Like what was, the, where was that seed planted? Corey, I was just, I was just so good looking that mm-hmm. I couldn't not do it. No, I, I, uh, I always wanted to, I don't know why when I was like five, I said, I want to be an actor and a pro football player. I don't know, maybe an astronaut in there at some point, but I don't know where that came from. I told my mom when I was like seven, I'm going to live in Los Angeles. Don't know what that came from. My sisters are much older than I. And when I would, uh, get ready for school they'd be like get ready fast actors have to learn how to change real fast like i have no idea i didn't know an actor i didn't know an actor when i eventually left to go act as an almost adult or an adult Uh, so it seems like something planted in me i really don't know where that came from but uh I just loved it. I just wanted to do it. I I had a entertainment in my DNA, uh, it, a weird sort of, I loved entertaining, but in a way didn't like attention. 
which is a weird, you know, I feel like I'm an extrovert introvert. Mm. I can put it on and really do it. But like, if I'm not doing that, if I'm like at a, at a social event, I'm in the corner kind of like, mm, I mean, I can talk. I'm not like rain man, but I'm just, it takes me a while to get loose. And, and when I'm doing that, it's not me, you know, I'm playing someone else. And so I can just put that anxiety aside and go do something. It's like, it's not me. It's whatever. So, um, something I, I almost unexplainable. Wow. Well, I glad I did it. Well, tell me this. So what's the best part of acting? And then what's the worst part? And I don't know if that's actually acting itself or the business, but you tell me, you know, that's so nuanced, but, uh, I mean, the best part is the best part is when you get, uh, uh, character and a part and something that you care about that you love saying the words and playing mm -hmm. and exploring the art of it which doesn't always you know much of it is a job you know uh and but the you know the job it's still the job i'm you know i'm not coal mining it's a it's a it's wonderful and blessed to be able to do something i went out to do and it, it's my passion and 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 love and set out to do but you know you still get to get up at five in the morning and go do it and then read stuff that you don't know what you're there's just stuff it's just a, you know sometimes a job and press and going to cities to do press and and being you know uh it's good and bad but like you'll be gone from home you'll be out of the country for eight months uh which is great but also you get lonely yeah. You know, there's uh, there's all those aspects, but ultimately, what a lucky guy I've been! What a lucky life! Yeah, because every job's got to be completely different, almost, right? Which is a great thing to me. You know, I I love that that the monotony would get to me. A nine to five would get to me. I knew that one of the reasons I just I just knew I'm, you know, ADD, and I just the monotony of anything would get to me. So I love the the change and uh, get to do something completely different. So that that's the great part. That's the creative part. The, uh, the, a lot of the other parts aren't as, just aren't, aren't as fun. Right. What was the one, what was your first role where you're like, I made it like this. I, I'm an actor now. This is, I've, I've reached that level. I kind of want to, and maybe I haven't reached it yet, but yeah, I guess it, there was, you know, there's increments and in times, you know, the first time I really got paid, mm. I was like, I'm a professional actor now. It was when I moved to New York City and I, and it didn't, you can tell this was a step, but I got a job understudying on Broadway. So I was like, I'm getting paid. I'm that that's a professional actor. And then I, uh I booked a movie and it went to Sundance and that felt cool and then little things it was fun like I my first episode of television like so many New York actors I had gone to New York first was uh a law and order sure you know and so that all my friends got to see and that felt so cool and then I, I did G.I. Jane which was a big Hollywood movie and that felt a lot as soon as I go back to New York, I I sort of, I booked this a season on this show called New York Undercover. And that felt like, okay, I'm rolling. And then you mm. start, you know, start getting offers rather than just auditioning. And then you start feeling that feels pretty good. Let's go to G.I. Jane real quick. Um, what was that like? You were Nate, you you portrayed someone that was going through Navy Trills, Navy SEALs training. And uh, that's the movie where Demi Moore is in it and she's trying to be the first female Navy SEAL. You know, you hear about Platoon and Full Metal Jacket where the cast had to go through boot camp for two weeks and, and you know, sleep in the mud. What was your preparation like for that role? We did. We had to go down there and they had full set of SEALs like, uh, that were there to make sure it all looked right and uh, to put us through stuff. But there was the background that played all the other seals in our class were mostly all navy seals mm. so they were they put us through it really uh it was really hard but ultimately i wasn't in 
you know, SEAL school class. I forget what they call it. I, I was not in that. But we had to carry boats around and in and stand and get in the ocean, which was freezing, and nuts to butts where you just sit there and start getting hypothermia and then swim two miles and come back. And uh, there's so many stories there. So such a great time. I mean, but it was hard. But ultimately, you know, we went right. home at the end of the day. I, I, I realized, though, why I could never be a SEAL from that i could do physically anything i was young i i could go then but i couldn't ever uh the sleep deprivation that they go through in buds buds that's the trip sleep deprivation and then the cold i'm not built for the cold and they they've I couldn't do those things. I could do anything else. I guess really mentally is what it means. I'm not tough enough to be a SEAL. Physically, mm-hmm. I could do stuff, but mentally, and that's 98% of it is the, yeah. mentally. I couldn't do it. Yeah, another fun role you had was in the perfect storm. You were a helicopter pilot. And I remember you just saying shit over and over again. Shit. And <laughs> yeah. let's go behind let's go behind the scenes here. Cause obviously you weren't in a real helicopter above the Atlantic Ocean, but were you in a studio and you've got wind machine and a rain machine and there's a camera and you, they tell you to look, you know, 45 degrees down and say shit over and again, like explain people behind the scenes on how you shoot something like that. It was unbelievable. That was at the time, the most expensive movie you ever made. At the really? Time. Yeah. And oh, wow. it was, it was on Warner brothers lot. And it, at the time it was the biggest indoor uh, body of water at the time like that that they built for it and it was I, I don't know the dimensions but it was huge and it had a blue screen all around mm. it so they can put anything in it they had the boat or it's sometimes the helicopter in a gimbal in the middle of this thing so it would turn and twist while you know while you're on it but uh literally it was like the they would say okay start the waves and one big wave machine Mm. would start and all right start the other and it would start and then they'd say start the rain and then they would just you could barely see and then they'd say smoke it up and then they'd say start the dump tank which was basically a tank but it's like imagine having a pool in overhead and every as soon as it would fill up again they just dump it and you couldn't see the rain. Oh, the wind. Start the wind, which was jet engines just Jeez. blowing. It was just. And you couldn't see. And they'd be like, swim, swim. But it'd just be swim towards this light. You couldn't. You couldn't see it. You couldn't. And if you opened it. Was... So it was really pretty cool. People Spielberg visited to look at it. I remember Donald Trump came to look at the set. I mean, it was an anom- it was a big, big deal then. And uh, uh, the first time I ever went in, I remember going in, and they they have a bunch of uh, people, safety swimmers underneath you with tanks, you know. Um, but went in, and you're supposed I was supposed to grab onto this rope to pull up on a on a boat it was the first thing we shot and i and they said action and did all that and we got in and go and immediately a wave went right down my throat and oh it's water and but they couldn't really see what's going on and I, and if you want to cut it you just cut but it was my first scene You have all these stuntmen around every, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of people and the actors here. So I, I would have drowned before I did that. And then they cut for something else like, Oh, this gimbal's not working or, and I was like, Holy shit. Can we cuss? Sure. Holy shoot. So I, uh, I just, was like oh my god and from then on out that was the only time that happened the very first time i was prepared for everything in, in, in fact there were times where i had to fall in this and swim like it, you know 70 yards like i said towards the light whatever with all this going on and keep doing it well eventually for further ones 
they couldn't have me do it 80 times. That's when the stunt man would do it when it was a mm. further shot. So you couldn't really tell. And one time the stunt man called, called it. And I was like, yes, he called cut. I'm cool. But uh, it was unbelievable, man. And I was in a helicopter a lot of the time above that uh, with the green screen or blue screen. And that one point, just when, when the helicopter goes down, I was in the helicopter strapped in right above the water about 12 feet and they'd say action and they just drop it into the water and there's a scene in it and you're strapped in and the water comes up and you see me go and that's all real and then it's there's all these cameras in there and it, that was that was tough that was tough claustrophobic had to undo myself it, that was kind of fun but yeah brutal. yeah absolutely Jeez, thanks for sharing that. Uh, when you finally moved to LA, did uh, who was the first celebrity? You, like when I've been to LA, every time I'm there, I, I feel like I see someone. It's it's kind of neat. But who did you first see when you moved there? Like, oh, there's that guy walking down the street. I can't remember the first, but one of the coolest things when I moved to Los Angeles, it was right, right in the middle of Titanic fever. I mean, that was the most popular. It became the highest grossing movie ever. And it was Leonardo DiCaprio was it. You know, mm -hmm. he was, and I became friends with him through a buddy of mine, Dash Myhawk, who's one of my best friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was in Romeo and Juliet with him. So I was young and they we were all young and we would go out. And I got to watch this Beatle mania with Leonardo DiCaprio was one of the, you know, and this is over years, a few years. And I just got to watch, you know, what that was like. It'd be like, you know, going out with uh, uh, the Rat Pack and, and, and seeing Sinatra all the time. It was, unbelievable experience and, and something to behold but josh you seeing that up close is that something that you would like to have or do you see like that's too much i need some anonymity like what was your thought well, uh there's a lot of that but i mean it was a perfect there was no social media so it was the last perfect time mm -hmm. <laughs> to do that you know and now it's hard to it's hard to be that type of movie star now because they have so much access. You know, there's some anonymity, not anonymity, but there's stuff they can't get to. It's like when I was young and Michael Jackson, a thriller video would come on. I'd wait there, all my friends would wait there all day, all week to see it instead of, oh, it's out. Let's go watch it on YouTube eight times in a row and we're done with it. And that creates a certain, you know, that's the velvet rope. And that was still that time where they couldn't quite get to him in that way. And people can't, couldn't tweet like I saw him and he was a dick at this, you know, just. And so it was the last time of that. And that was cool because then he was just picking any role he wanted to look, which he still does. Mm -hmm. But it was cool to see, you know, that was quite an experience. And it was pretty cool to be in the circle. Got to admit, as a young, young kid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and just think about this. Like, let's go back in the time machine here and, and put this in the Kentucky basketball. But you would see who Kentucky signed every year back in the day, pre-social media internet. You'd be like, okay, this guy's a five-star, six-nine guy from Indianapolis. And it wasn't until the blue-white game, you'd be like, oh, that's Walter McCarthy. Oh, now yeah. I see why he's five stars. So, like, that's why people camped out for those games. It's like, yeah. let's see him in person. We're now – you know, the eighth graders mixtape, yeah, you know, mix yeah. Tape. Don't get me started on highlight tapes. I, that's yeah. one of my banes, um, slow motion or replays in slow motion. Like, right, right, right. That's can't, can't take it, huh? Oh, Drives no. Crazy. Well, it's, if you're a coach, a coach doesn't give a shit about anything on a mixtape, right? No, but as and, a fan, it means nothing too, but there are things you can see. Like when Ashton Haggins was coming and they saw, I saw his mixtape, I was like, there wasn't one jump shot 
on that next day. Oh, wow. It was him going around people every time. You know, you can glom onto things. It means nothing. But you also can tell that, I mean, I'm so happy we got DJ Wagner, but you can tell from his mixtape, he ain't John Wall. Right. You know, <laughs> there are things you can glom from it. Basics. But you see, when you're at interview with Goodman, where Goodman talked about, Wagner and how he's probably not a good fit for Kentucky because of his volume shooting that always stuck in my head. So when he signed, I was like, huh, this will be interesting based on Jeff Goodman's assessment, you know? Yeah. I mean, and it was, I think it was just, and I worry about it too, with that. I had already thought about with that team with Dillingham, who is a ball dominant guard, who a volume shooter, they, they are both that. So I do worry about that. Well, that's why so, Cal gets paid ten million a year is to figure out those those first world problems, you know. Yeah, well, he's got he's got some figuring out to do right now. We're recording this January 9th, by the way. So for oh, you, okay. those of you listening to this in August, you'll have no clue. What's oh, happening. I didn't know it was then. I didn't know. Oh, I don't know when it's coming out, but I'm just saying, oh, okay. if anyone listens to this in the future, <laughs> well, hey, whatever. They're like, wow, they really turned it around. They were at their low then, and I can't believe they won it. That's yeah, yeah. Hope. This will be what uh, <laughs> April of twenty four. They'll be like, oh, those two a holes. They didn't. They didn't know uh, Cunningham and Wagner would be, you know, two All Americans and lead them to their title. So, hey, yeah. exactly. what do we know? Okay, a piece of advice for those listening out there that want to get into acting, Josh. What would be the basic basic prescription you'd give them? Well, see, that's the problem with acting because I'm all, I'm constantly you know will you talk to my nephew who wants to and who, it, there's no go to school graduate in this take the LSAT go do mm -hmm. this uh, uh, there is none of that you have to everyone finds their own way the only thing I tell people when I sit down with you know kids or people that want to do it and they are like uh First, if they're like, I want to be an actor or a model or something, I'm like, that is, this is not what you want to do. You have to have a, a passion for it. And I've been told no more than anyone you know. Mm -hmm. I've gone out for so many thousands of things and been told no. And it takes, uh, specific personality and specifically one that is not going to take no for an answer at some point. You just, okay, well, next, next, next. And if you're kind of like, that'd be cool because I want to be on TV or fame, it's just not going to work for you. Um, also, I tell, and this is kind of, I don't mean to be this negative, but when people are like, I really want to do this or I want to be an architect, I'm like, be an architect. Right, right. If if that's your thing, if you, I remember I was, and I don't even remember this story that well, but my, my buddy Opie, we call him Brad, he, he uh, when I first moved to New York City, he came up and, and stayed in my apartment and he was like, this is cool, this is fun. How long are you going to give this? And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, I mean, how many, how long till you say, okay. I was like, until it happens. He tells me that story. I don't, and and that's that's what it was. That's what it had to be. Uh, you have to be serious about it. And if you yeah. like, yeah, it'd be cool. But now it's completely different. Now people can make their own content from home. Right. People are YouTubing and and doing. You know, there's creative people doing really funny, great stuff that gets them attention and they don't have to leave all their friends and move to a giant city and start to work it out. You know, there's different pathways. So I'm a dinosaur in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. These kids are, these kids are doing it differently. Is there, was there a role that uh, you were like one of the last two and it would have really been a big time movie and you just lost out on it barely that just sure. kind of digs at you? Uh, you know, I am a, a there's a reason for everything mm -hmm. type of guy and maybe that's if it's a cop out if it's whatever you think I, but i am that and uh jerry Maguire, i they flew me out to read with tom cruise and cameron crowe and uh to play 
Jerry O'Connell to play the, the quarterback that was going right. to get drafted. I remember the line too. It's going to be Denver or LA. And I, he was like, well, I'll either, uh, I'll either surf or ski. That was like the line. And I went in and, and, and read with Tom Cruise, man. And it was just so cool. And yeah, I, I went well and went back and, and obviously didn't end up getting it. I saw the, uh, casting director a couple of years later and you know truth or not she was like you know if you lived in LA if you were there I think you might have you would have gotten that you would have been they they were s- called people back over and over because they didn't know what to you know and I was like now that hurt but uh because that would have changed my life for sure I mean that yeah. was the biggest movie I would have you uh, know had a a run of uh, movies i would have been i would have definitely had a different career but right then i didn't get it and right then i ended up getting gi jane which is you know not near as successful not even near the part but i met some of my best friends i ever ever had and have carried through life Mm -hmm. and i always think in my maturity level then if i had gotten this this opportunity possibly I would have done some stupid shit embarrassed my family I don't you know like I don't know how I would have reacted maturity wise and that'd be the last thing I'd, I you know that hurts it was just the biggest thing ever but I lived through right. that and I do see like I don't sit back and regret anything that's for sure but that was you read with Tom Cruise that was cool that's pretty neat my wife, she runs her own production company, and uh, she did acting in college. And um, when she was a kid, she tried out for the role of Meryl Streep's daughter in Bridges of Madison County. And wow. she was the finalist, her and another girl. Uh, and she lost it. And uh, the other girl, gosh, it's not Sarah Pauly. It's someone famous Sarah now. but Paulson? Not Sarah, Sarah Paulson. Paulson. Sarah Pauly? Maybe. Maybe it's no one. Don't okay. quote me on this. I'm sure but, uh, she is. I'm bad at that. I'm sure. Yeah. But she's like, man, what if I would have gotten that? I'm just, and I use the same thing you say. Well, we might not be here today now right, with right. our family. Had mm-hmm. you been hanging out with Clint Eastwood and Meryl Streep and, you know, farm exactly. country, Iowa. Exactly. So, yeah. So I get For a that. reason. For a reason. Um, your father, Larry Hopkins, was a uh, representative of the state of Kentucky in the Congress uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives for some time. Yeah. And what was the best part about your dad being in Congress? What was the worst part? Well, you know, I didn't really, I, it was my formative years. He went in Congress when I was eight or nine or, and I didn't know any different. You know, it was just like if he was a plumber, mm. it was, you know, the worst parts for me were when I was young and we'd get stopped at going to the movie by a constituent and he'd be like, you know, how are you going to vote on that tobacco bill? That would be mm. like, I have to talk. And I'd be pulling on him like, come on, come on. But there was always sort of an unwritten rule. Like he'd look at me like, stop it. I'm mm. like, okay. Or he'd be like, this crazy rascal's pulling me away. We got to go. But that kind of sharing him and him being gone all the time. Yeah. You know, he was, uh, he'd come back almost every weekend, which is a lot on him. And he was so busy. I'd come home from school on a Thursday or, and he wouldn't be home yet. And when I'd get up for school, he was gone out visiting constituents and doing things and at fairs and glad handing and just, you know, talking to people. And so there was a lot of, he did a great job getting back from games and stuff whenever he could, but he was gone a lot. And that was, that was tough. I bet. What was some good parts of it? Um, that you as a kid could realize. Yeah, you know? for me as a kid, I remember we went to the Cincinnati Reds game and we sat like front row right mm-hmm. by the dugout right there. And they announced that he was there at the thing. And I was like, ah, oh, that's why we have these awesome seats. Mm-hmm. That kind of stuff was cool. But I mean... Again, I was just that stuff. I'd be like, "Oh," but uh, yeah, don't know any better. It's just normal, it's just, yeah. Just dad's job. 
Yeah. My dad used to work one floor above your dad's downtown. And I used to walk from Sarah to that building on Vine Street. And your office always had like. I had the little tube if you wanted to. You yeah. could get all through Lexington. <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, your office had candy up front. And I would pop in and like the secretary, I don't remember her name. I'd just be like, eh, go ahead, Corey. Every day I'd get candy. Then go up to the third floor. Then to get money from my dad to walk the tube over to Victoria Station yeah. or Victoria <laughs> yeah. Square uh, yeah, yeah, or Lexington yeah. Green, whatever it's called now, and uh, and get frozen yogurts. That was my Sarah <laughs> after school routine. But your dad's office was one of those stuff. Never saw your dad. Never saw well, him. I'm but glad uh, we could get you, you know, high on sugar. Yeah, a couple cavities, yeah. but uh, yeah. Josh, we're going to end on some quick hitters here. All right, you okay. you're familiar with these. Best player you've ever guarded. Best player ever guarded. I mean, in pickup. Well, we can do Sayer. I mean, there were some. I don't know Sayer's model, Kentucky School for the Deaf. I don't know if there were any ballers on those yeah. teams. Like, <laughs> yeah, there. I mean, Demarcus, did a Brian Station you know, sneak in there? Practice. Henry Clay. Uh, yeah, you know. Um, I don't know Aaron Greenfield at Tate's Creek. We didn't play too. Much. Uh, but I played like the Dirt Bowl. Oh yeah. You know, in the summer they didn't have AAU, and there were a lot of just kids you never hear of like daryl bates who was like my age and was like my I, he went to henry clay he ended up getting in a uh like a moped wreck so he couldn't but he was he was one of those five foot ten guys that could put it put, put the rim here and it, I, it it was so much fun but a lot of kids tim newsom who went to lafayette was you know they just kids that were so so good but they couldn't help you as much as they do now get to the finish line but i saw a lot of kids that could have could have done really and gotten a really good education but it they got off track how about pickup ball is there anyone that stands out uh i mean i know i'm going to be like you know uh when i was in high school i'd go down to um memorial and it was a different time i i could my buddies we could walk in to memorial and watch them play pickup with no coaches around and stuff now you could never do that but sometimes they'd be low and i'd go out you know play oh, really? tony delk yeah play tony tony delk you know and uh i just i just uh i just showed tony my full bag and he couldn't handle it I just, no, you know, those guys, I was, and they were my idols and they were almost my same age. And, uh, and I know I'm going to think of something sometime where, you know, I went to, <laughs> I went to this Lafayette camp thing when Michael Jordan was in town. I was uh, at we, that. I yeah, was at that. And yep. he uh, called me out you know, on this Josh, because he had sat next to my dad at the opening of the bluegrass games festival called me out and had so michael jordan is the hardest best player ever guarded the end period i win done you know i <laughs> you got that through uh your family connections i had to sign at super america had sign up here for a chance to see michael jordan clinic and we went all over town to super america's filling those out filling those out and i'll be damned we we got one of those tickets like willy wonka and That's i remember awesome. that i've got all these grainy pictures that I'm sure you're in as a little kid. Yeah, yeah. Or high school, or you would have been a high schooler then. I was in high school. I was in high school. That was, yeah, that was that's so cool. Lafayette. They opened it God. up, and it, that was fantastic. That was one of the biggest. And that was before that Michael Jordan was Michael Jordan fully. He hadn't won a title or anything. He was the coolest. What year player, would that have been? 89? 88, 88, 88, 89. He's still right pretty cool. The, oh, yeah. very cool, but. <laughs> Um, I mean, yeah. Yeah. What's the biggest win of your high school career? Model yeah. on the road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. KSD, probably neutral yeah. court. Uh, I don't know, man. We didn't. None stood out. It was tough, we man. We didn't win a ton. You know, like Sayre's good now. Mm -hmm. Sayre's really good. You know, my buddy, Robert Goodman, who's my point guard, is oh, yeah. the is the coach. Already this year, they beaten Tate's Creek and Henry Clay. They beat Henry Clay at Henry Clay. It's a new world. Well, my point guard Different. is the assistant coach, right, from my Lexington Catholic days, Brad Carter. And then right. you've got former Mr. Basketball and NCAA Final Four player Charles Thomas on the bench. So yeah. Rob's got a 
It's got yeah, a good little staff there. That squad, yeah. But it's I went and watched over Christmas break, and they would have beaten us by a hundred. Mm. They got like four kids dunking hard. I'm like, mm-hmm. we were like, I, I touched the rim, I got foam. I mean, we were. <laughs> it's a different world. Sayers good. Yeah, it's changed. Um, best sporting event you've ever been to live. Man, I've been to Super Bowls. I've watched us win it in 96 in the Meadowlands. I've watched us lose it several times. I watched us win it in 2012 in New Orleans. Uh, but you know the best sporting event I think I've ever been to, and I, I like I said, Super Bowls, that I was, I think I was 12 or 13, and I was in Rupp Arena for Villanova Georgetown. Oh, wow. I mean, that's that's tough, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's tough to beat. I was also at the NCAA football championship in L.A. at the Rose Bowl Pasadena for Texas USC. Reggie Bush, uh, uh, the, uh, was the quarterback, mm-hmm. Vince Young, Matt Liner. Uh, Matt Liner. I was there for what is still considered one of the greatest games of, of all time. So that's, that's cool. Those are two good ones. Two great ones. Yeah. The only one missing is like the Christian Leitner shot, which would be, you know, yeah. Good. Yeah. Answer, but yeah. Yeah. Best concert you've ever been to. Man. Or I, top uh, three. I know it's tough to narrow those down. This is, this is going to be out of the blue. Okay. This is going to be one you didn't expect. Last year. I finally got to go see my favorite band of all time. Pretty close, good seats, new edition. Ronnie, Bobby, it. Ricky, Mike, Ralph, and Johnny. And they all were there and they all did their own solo stuff and the full, and they were doing their dances. When I grew up, yeah. Yes, a boy band was my favorite concert. And, and they were just exactly my age. So I love their little candy girl. I was at Michael Jackson then, and they were the new Jackson 5. Mm-hmm. And as they got older and their music started to mature, it was right when I sort of did in the same way. And I just have always loved New Edition. Now, that being said, I've been lucky. I got to see Michael Jackson and Prince live. I saw in a very intimate setting, uh, I saw um, uh, 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 Rocket Man. Did I mean, oh, uh, Elton John. Elton John. I mean, I've gotten to see a lot of really cool stuff. I mean, I was from here to back there to Elton John singing a song, and that was dumbfounding. And to see Prince, and to see Michael Jackson. I mean, those are you, you as you know, in our podcast, we ask if you could go front row center for any and. Uh, I've I had already a lot of them are Michael Jackson and Prince people say and I've lucky I've, I did that. Yeah, I saw Prince at Co- well, I saw Prince at Coachella. He played six cover songs. And I was like, "What are you playing covers for? Like you've you could play for eight hours of hits." And that bothered me. But no, my top like concert all time. He played Radiohead's "Creep." Um, see, I couldn't I tell think you the that's other ones. Cool as shit. I'd I, almost re- just sit here Prince's rendition of that and. I, I love that. I can hear him play Purple Rain every day. I could never hear True, him play Creed. But he has two greatest hit CDs, not one, two. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, now, I get your beat, festival. but I'm saying that's pretty cool. We saw Duran Duran at Coachella, and those sons of bitches played a hit and then their whole new album and like two oh, hits. And everyone's standing no. like, what are you doing? So to me, yeah. like, to me, that goes in there. But my top concert of all time, which is why I framed it behind me there is uh i was in roskill day which is a festival in denmark that it's famous for that's where the tin guys got trampled during pearl jam mm, yeah. um, and that's where they changed Fine. concert seating after that but uh, the chemical brothers came on at 1 a.m and i was like all right i, I know block rock and beats and it was eighty thousand europeans and everyone there got it it made sense so chemical brothers number one and radiance machine reuniting at coachella after eight years just oh yeah, well, that's the thing too. It's because it's not just just the artist. It's when the audience catches a vibe, you know, exactly. when everyone's there together. Now that that is very cool. 
because my the Chemical Brothers then came back to Coachella, and I took my now wife. I was like, "Oh, you're going to see the Chemical Brothers; it's going to change your life." And it wasn't the same, right? Same yeah, set, just didn't catch the vibe, right? And that's what's crazy. crazy is you'll see a band you love and like, oh, it was okay, and then like Flaming Lips at Coachella. When I saw them in '04, it made me go back to seven more Coachellas trying to recreate that first rush. And yeah, Flaming Lips are fine. She don't use jelly, you know. Their their songs. But something happened where everyone in the audience was connected with the band. And it's who would ever think to that would happen with that? And I'm you know, it's all about mood and setting, right? Exactly. You know, one that was great for me, uh, it was at Lollapalooza. And this is obviously a long time ago, so stay with me. Kanye West. And he was he had come back to Chicago. It was, you know, oh, he was the 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 child of Chicago that made it huge. Came mm -hmm. back, and it was crazy. I was side stage. His mother was right next to me. Rest in peace. And you think back to that because I I've always loved Kanye, and until recently it, as an artist, and that was the height of it and the cool. And that was what every thing he did that was experimental or not was cool and ex really changed hip hop. And now I think that was much cooler now that sadly he's um, mentally ill and I don't know that we'll ever get him, him back. He, I think that's really sad. It's despicable everything he said, but we are watching a mental breakdown live in front of us no excuses for him mm -hmm. but it's it's still sad it's kind of reminds me of the charlie sheen tiger blood thing you know to see someone publicly go through a mental episode is just so sad yeah and you know so he had a basketball academy right and yeah, donda yeah he's got That's all the money in the world to fund it a lot of these basketball academies shut down because of money well their money wasn't problem it was bad management right his and his mouth and his, his mouth. mouth yeah so but that's his mom's name was donda that bring it full circle. yeah he could have made that place an amazing place with his resources mm -hmm. and thinking outside the box but i'm with you mm -hmm. i've seen kanye at ross Day in denmark i saw him at coachella headline i've seen him in dc he killed it every single time josh just killed it yeah <laughs> yeah well, <laughs> like one his... point you, you know that thing in Again, back to this magazine, they they were actually there and you could flip them. You remember Us Magazine had like, I, I forget what it was, but it was like 22 things you don't know about me. And they did that on me once. And one of my things was Kanye West is my favorite artist. And I'm like, erase that. Oh, that, you that, didn't that know. work now. <laughs> yeah, you I know, know he's going to lose. You know it. how it is now. People look at it like, you're. Go, you're but, canceled. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From. <laughs> 14 years ago. Charlie Sheen's my best friend, uh, Kanye West. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be on The Apprentice with Donald Trump. You know, all this stuff that you canceled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> my idol's Donald Trump. <laughs> Charlie oh, Sheen does have Tiger Blood. Where, uh, what's next for you? You know, you're going to keep doing the Rex Chapman podcast, but professionally, what what do you got coming up? Uh, You know, this is a, a, a weird thing. I was, the next thing I'm doing, I was actually on in that movie called rust the western mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. alec baldwin uh you know uh the gun discharged and and killed the dp the director of photography in a and uh, i was there that day and of course we were about three quarters of the way done and of course everything ended it was just a tragedy and she was so lovely and yeah, you know, that was brutal, and we went away. And I assumed we would never go back to that. That just didn't feel right. Doesn't seem like something you should do. Her husband, uh, you know, they had a bunch of legal things, and they settled it and whatnot. And he's a producer on the film now, and he wants it finished. He had said he had come when she when she had passed he came before we all left to go home and and spoke to everyone and he was so eloquent and lovely and expressed that her passion in life was 
director of photography of being an artist and she was so happy to be doing this film and she was doing such wonderful work you can imagine you know it's like a big sky western that's a director of photography's dream right. and she was just wonderful and you know it's devastating and but he was so lovely and then uh a few months ago the they called and said, he wants it finished. He wants people to see her work. He says that she would want it finished. Um, and I said, I said, that's lovely. And I appreciate that. And I'm, I believe you, but I have to hear that from his mouth. So they did, they put me on a zoom with him and he was again, eloquent, lovely, expressed himself in a beautiful way and said, this is means a lot to me. My son, they have a 10-ish year old son that knows, so what a child that doesn't know what's going on in the midst of the worst time you could ever lose your mother probably, that wants it done. And uh, then of course, I'm like, of course, of course I will. But it's, it's odd, you know, that's going to be, people want to be, outrage there's going to be people protesting and you know people that don't know anything about it right you know that want to be angry um so it's a weird weird thing but i'm going back to that in uh march to finish and okay. we don't have a whole lot to finish but i'm growing my beard back out now i have to try it'll never get to where it was <laughs> we'll have to fake it some but uh that's the next thing in line for me gotcha well josh where can people find you uh, uh, at Mr. Josh Hopkins on, um, Twitter and Instagram. Okay. And probably I've signed up for all the new stuff too, but I don't go to them just to see what people, what is it? The, like the, the TikTok, um, the TikTok, the tactic. Mm -hmm. I do that. I'm, I'm old. No. Uh, but I Twitter and Instagram. And then of course, the Rex Chapman show with Josh Hopkins on all, anywhere you can get a podcast and, and see it. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for joining Josh. I appreciate it. Um, it's good talking I'm to you after to be here. all thanks, these decades. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Great to see you. Yeah. And uh, for those that uh, like this, please make sure you subscribe at YouTube or on all the podcasting platforms. And uh, thanks so much for joining us, Josh. Thank you. And everyone have a great day and cut. Josh, thanks so much for joining, man. I've got a crying baby downstairs, so <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go luck. help with that. But thanks so much, and uh, I'll keep listening, my man. Corey, man, I appreciate it. Uh, I had a ball, and um, thanks. Thanks, man. Yeah. Go go take care of your child. All right. See you later, buddy. See you. Bye-bye.